In a follow-up to my last video, today I'll be addressing the question, why is there systematic conditioned sound change? Rather than speech sounds just all changing in random directions over the course of time, they change in orderly ways that can be described with fairly coarse grain rules. Sound A changes to sound B if it's surrounded by the following sounds. As I mentioned in my last video, these changes sometimes have exceptions, but in general they can be very well described by this small set of rules. In fact, this is why whole swathes of historical linguistics are possible, because we can see not random similarities between the words of different languages, but systematic correspondences. On the face of it, this seems kind of weird. Why would there be this systematic pattern? More to the point, how do these changes happen in orderly ways without anyone being conscious of it or doing it deliberately? Middle English had a long vowel, or, in words like morn, sawn, gorse. In the late Middle English period, into the early modern period, it changed in quality, so it was moon, soon, goose, which is much more like the modern quality in most dialects. But there's no commentary from the time to suggest that people realised this was going on, much less that it was a systematic process of change affecting all or most of the eligible words. How did it happen systematically and neatly if people weren't aware of it? To frame the question in a modern context, many speakers of Southeastern British English today don't say there, pair, fair, but there, pair, fair with a much lower tongue position on the vowel. So some subsection of the population has applied this sound change to their speech without any of the individuals ever consciously thinking about the fact that they were applying a systematic change. Why is it that this sound change affects all of these words rather than just randomly affecting one of them? Why don't they just say there, pair, fur with the sound changing in random directions and the words becoming dissimilar to each other? If the individual people aren't paying attention to the sound change, why is it so orderly and neat? Well, let's start by thinking about this very abstractly. In this video, I'm going to talk about language from a neurological perspective. Um, so I will emphasize at the start that the neurobiology of language perception is not perfectly well understood. Um, we understand quite a lot about it and there's a lot of data on it but it's not perfectly understood. So I'm going to produce uh, a kind of abstract systemic description here, which may not be completely accurate in the details, um, but which is in principle the kind of system that a brain might use to understand and to produce language. We'll limit this to spoken language rather than sign language, although I wouldn't be surprised if there was a whole body of literature on sign change as well. But human spoken language is a system. What does the system have to do? It has to communicate quite complicated information between individuals, and it has to be highly adaptable to different situations and environments, so that if the speakers were to go to a different place or encounter a new type of animal or plant or natural event, they could extend the language so they could communicate effectively about this new thing. This is very simplified, as I'm sure somebody's already pointing out in the comments, but we'll add more detail as we go along. The way this communication system works is by using sounds to symbolise useful concepts and things, and it wants to do this in a way that's both efficient, not too much more complicated than it needs to be, but also powerful and expansive. Mechanically, this system relies on human vocalisations, hearing and auditory processing, so it's limited by the limits of those things. This imposes certain restrictions on how the symbols can be constructed. You could have an entirely unique sound for every single concept, every lexical item, every word being pronounced in its own totally unique and irreducible way. Now, the human vocal apparatus can only produce so many sounds that it's possible for the human hearing apparatus to distinguish from each other. One way you can get around this is by using the time axis. If you make the sequences of sounds longer and longer, you have a lot more space to play around with. But the brain then has to use masses and masses of metabolic resources for maintaining instructions to the muscles of how to produce all of these unique sounds, different ones for each word. Surely there's a more efficient way of doing this. Well, there is. 
In our analogy at the moment, I'm treating the word as the fundamental contrastive unit. A squirrel is different from an apple, and therefore the word for squirrel is different from the word for apple. But you can make all this more efficient by adding a couple more layers of structure below the level of the word. What if you had a limited number of sounds that you could perform with your vocal muscles, each one requiring not that many metabolic resources to maintain in the brain, and you just put these sounds in different orders to make different words? In this case, the word for squirrel doesn't need to have this whole complex motor program in the brain for which order you have to move which muscles to say squirrel. Instead, it can just have a simple instruction of seven or so of your preset sounds that you say in a particular order. The instructions for the preset sounds could be stored independently of any particular word or meaning. So instead of having to remember a million sounds, one for each word, you just have to remember 50 or so sounds and then what order you have to put those sounds in to make each word. It's a lot more compact. So that's why phonology, a small set of categorically distinct speech sounds that don't really mean anything unless combined in a certain order, is very useful. It's easy to imagine why the human brain might have been pressured to evolve a system like that. I should say at this point that this probably isn't totally accurate to how the brain actually does it. I've sort of implied that the brain has, for each word, a semantic concept linked to a sequence of phonemes and then some kind of central phoneme database explaining how the phonemes should be pronounced. For one thing, the brain is clearly aware of features below the level of the phoneme, such as the fact that some phonemes are voiced with a buzzing of the larynx, v, b, d, and some are voiceless without that buzzing, f, p, t. There's mounting neurological evidence that the brain encodes these kinds of subphonemic features, and it isn't just blind below the level of the phoneme. The brain tends to work in a way that's probabilistic. It doesn't necessarily have very rigid, hard and fast rules, but instead it works based on probability curves of any given thing happening in any given situation. It also seems to prune and arrange its circuitry in a very efficient way. If it can possibly reuse the same bundle of neurons for a couple of different things, it will. This means that as you're gradually picking up your first language as a child, the brain will build up an idea of how to pronounce different lexical items, different words and phrases, and as it goes along, it will notice probabilistic patterns in the data. The vowels in cat and pan require most of the same muscle movements as each other, and the vowels in dress and pen likewise uh, with a different set of muscle movements. And it will use these patterns to prune its circuitry so that perhaps the words dress and pen will have a lot of overlapping circuitry, reflecting the fact that its vowels are pronounced the same. This means that the brain will naturally end up with a system that has something like phonemes configured into it. It's just that they're a lot fuzzier and more probabilistic than the simplified model that I presented initially. This system is still broadly subject to the evolutionary pressures I described earlier. The brain obviously wants to work more efficiently because that means less calories need to be consumed for the same amount of brain function. And this desire for efficiency produces this pseudo-phonemic way of producing speech where the brain kind of reuses a small set of sounds in different words. Or more specifically, it reuses certain neural circuitry for producing the sounds and so the sounds end up clustering together in little categories. There's room for a little bit of untidiness around the edges, and so people's phonemic systems will often have little idiosyncrasies that don't fit into the rules. One of my own idiosyncrasies came up in a recent conversation I had with the phonologist John Harris, which I'll upload soon. For the pronoun our, as in our house, like many Southern English speakers, I have an unstressed form our, our house, and a stressed form our, our house. The unstressed form R is used most of the time, but I sometimes use the stressed form our. I think this is a common pattern in some English dialects. However, this stressed form our sounds categorically different to the unit of time, an hour. Our, 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 our. For me, one has ow and the other one has the longer ow. It may sound trivial if you don't have this feature in your own dialect, 
but to me they're categorically different and if I said them the wrong way round I'd feel the need to correct myself. It feels like a categorical distinction, a little bit like cat versus cut. I feel that hour and hour are completely different words with different vowels. By many definitions, this would mean that ow and ow were two different phonemes for me, adding a whole new phoneme to the system for a contrast that only distinguishes two words. But in a more probabilistic theory of phonology, it's easy to explain. When I was a kid, I mainly heard the stressed form of our from my northern relatives, who don't have the unstressed form of it in their dialect, or at least don't use it very often. But I picked up the word our in the normal way from southerners who lived around me. So the two words ended up with two different pronunciations, and as I've continued hearing them in different social situations, my brain has been quite happy to maintain the distinction. There are a few different pressures influencing how the brain maintains this circuitry and how it's configured. As I said, there's the tendency for words to reuse a relatively small set of motor programs in the vocal tract, meaning that a relatively small set of phonemes emerges. But this can't be too small. Take that to the extreme and you'd just be pronouncing all words identically, in which case nobody would be able to decode what you were trying to say. The brain wants a reasonably large set of phonemes, or possibly syllables, but not so large that it becomes metabolically inefficient. But there's a third pressure as well, the pressure for ease of production. Maintaining brain circuitry isn't the only thing that takes calories. Moving your vocal muscles also burns calories, and so the brain isn't just under pressure to have a relatively small number of phonemes, but also to make sure that the vocal muscles don't have to do a load of ridiculous gymnastics to produce those phonemes. This doesn't just apply within one phoneme, but also between phonemes, going from one phoneme to another can't be too mechanically difficult. The natural consequence of this is that these broad phonemes will diverge in pronunciation slightly depending on what sounds come before and after them. An example would be that in many dialects of American English, the a phoneme will have a slight glide in it when it comes before certain nasal consonants like n, cat versus can. This will gradually happen over time as speakers pronounce the word in a more efficient way and listeners gradually learn to accept that as a normal pronunciation of the word that they should expect to hear. The system I've just outlined, again, should be taken as a rough sketch of the kind of thing the brain might be doing. I probably overlooked some details and missed some of the literature here. But systematic sound changes would be a natural property of this system or a similar system. Partly because a lot of the neural circuitry for pronouncing the a sound will overlap between the words that have that sound. And so, when the sound changes in one word, there's automatically pressure for it to change in all or many of them. This is something I've anecdotally found when I've been dialect coaching. I won't go into project-specific detail, but if you ask people to voice certain phonemes in a particular environment, turning a p into a b and a t into a d, they will often accidentally overextend this rule to other phonemes, turning f into v and k into g, because clearly there's some neural overlap that means making the change in one phoneme causes the change to automatically generalise to others as well. And this change permeates through the whole language because listeners, especially new listeners, young children, will construct their phonology based on the range of examples they hear from the people around them. Each new generation will have a slightly different idea of how phonemes should sound, solidifying the mechanical changes made by their parents' generation. As old forms slowly drop out of the language because of elderly speakers dying, they eventually become forgotten and even unacceptable. For example, in the 1700s there was an active discourse around whether the word nature should be pronounced nature or nature. Nowadays, nature has totally fallen out of use and is in fact considered unacceptable by native speakers. If a child used it, they'd probably be corrected by an adult. So the final question, and a harder one to answer, is why do sound changes sometimes stop being productive before they've affected all the relevant words? In the last video I mentioned the Southern English phonemic split, where the A vowel in cat, bath, can, lowered and eventually backed before f, s, th, and nt, systematically resulting in the modern situation, where cat, can, and tab are pronounced with A, 
but bath, pass and can't are pronounced with R. A couple of eligible words never took to the sound change. Chaff and ant remain chaff and ant rather than changing to chaff and aunt. Why would these be left over? As I say, this is a harder question to answer in terms of the neurology. I would guess that these might be best analysed on a case-by-case basis. Sociolinguistic factors are known to influence pronunciation even within one speaker. In the case of chaff, one potential explanation, albeit difficult to find concrete evidence for, might be that people undergoing the trap bath split lived in urban areas and they didn't talk about chaff very much, and they only ever heard the word from rural people who hadn't yet taken on the trap bath split. So while they heard words like bath and pass very often from their urban friends who had the sound change, they only ever heard chaff from rural people whose accents didn't contain the sound change. And so this fostered some resistance to the change, causing it to remain with the cat, can vowel until such a time as the sound change has separated the two vowel phonemes so much that it would be downright weird to start saying chaff because it was so different from the pronunciation everyone else used. This doesn't cause any big loss of neural efficiency because there's still an a phoneme which the word chaff can leverage the neural circuitry for. I hope this video has provided an overview of how systematic sound change can emerge from a probabilistic neural system. There are swathes of literature on this that I haven't read and so I'm very happy to be corrected on aspects of it in the comments if anyone's better read on the phonology or on neuroscience data that I haven't come across. Thank you very much for watching and I'll talk to you again soon.